It was now some three hours since we had left our company. Everything stood out clearly against the snow. For some moments now, I had been staring at a black shape about 500 yards away. Ten minutes later, we could see that it was a hut. Our Feldwebel was walking toward it. It must be a shelter for railway workers. The Feldwebel raised his voice. Hurry up, we'll wait in that shelter over there. It didn't seem a bad idea. We had regrouped, and a young fellow covered with freckles, one of my snow-shoveling companions, was joking with his friend. We were making our way toward the butt when a violent burst of sound struck my ears. At the same moment I saw to the right of the hut a light puff of white smoke. Utterly astounded, I looked around at my companions. The Feldwebel had flung himself down on the ground like a goalie onto a ball and was loading his automatic. The fellow with the freckles was staggering toward me with enormous eyes and a curious stupefied expression. When he was about six feet from me, he fell to his knees. His mouth opened as if he wanted to shout, but no sound came, and he toppled over backward. A second barrage of sound ripped the air, followed by a modulated whistle. Without thinking, I threw myself flat on the snow. The Feldwebel's automatic crackled, and I saw some snow from the roof of the butt shoot up into the air. I couldn't take my eyes off the freckled young soldier, whose motionless body lay a few yards away. Cover me, you idiots, the Feldwebel shouted as he jumped up and ran forward. I looked at the freckled soldier's friend. He seemed more surprised than frightened. Calmly, we aimed our weapons toward the woods, from which a few shots still rang out, and began to fire. The detonation of my Mauser restored some of my confidence, but I was still very scared. Two more bullets whistled in my ears. Our sergeant, with appalling self-assurance, stood up and threw a grenade. The air rang with the noise of the explosion, and one of the worm-eaten planks of the butt disintegrated. With incomprehensible calm, I continued to stare at the cabin. The Feldwebel's automatic was still firing. Without panic, I slid another bullet into the barrel of my gun. As I was about to shoot, two black figures ran from the ruins of the hut and headed toward the forest. It was a perfect opportunity. My gun sight stood out clearly in black against the white of the countryside, and then merged into the darkness of one of the galloping figures. I pressed the trigger and missed. Our chief had run as far as the hut, firing after the fleeing men without hitting them. After a moment, he signaled us to join him, and we extricated ourselves from our holes in the snow. The Feldwebel was staring at something in the ruins of the cabin. As we drew closer, we could see a man leaning against the wall. His face, half covered by a wild, shaggy beard, was turned toward us. His eyes looked damp. He gazed at us without a word. His clothes of skin and fur were not a military uniform. My eye was caught by his left hand. It was soaked with blood. More blood was running from his collar. I felt a twinge of unease for him. The Feldwebel's voice brought me back to reality. Partisan, he shouted. Hein, you know what you're going to get. He pointed his gun at the Russian who seemed frightened and rolled farther back into the corner. I too recoiled, but our noncom was already putting his automatic back in its holster. You take care of him, he ordered, waving toward the wounded man. We carried the partisan outside. He groaned and said something unintelligible. The sound of an approaching train was growing steadily louder. This one, however, was returning to the rear. We managed to stop it. Three soldiers wrapped in heavy reindeer skin coats jumped from the first carriage. One of them was a lieutenant, and we snapped to attention. What in God's name do you think you're doing? He barked. Why did you stop us? Our noncom explained that we were looking for labor. This train is carrying only the wounded and dying, the lieutenant said. If we had some troops on leave, I'd help you out. As it is, I can't do anything for you. We've got two wounded men, the sergeant ventured. The lieutenant was already walking over to the freckled soldier, who was lying motionless where he had fallen. You can see that this one's dead. No, mein lieutenant, he's still breathing. Uh, well, maybe. But another fifteen minutes. He gestured vaguely. Well, all right. We'll take him. He whistled at two skeletal stretcher bearers, who lifted our young comrade. I thought I could see a brown stain in the middle of his back but I wasn't sure whether it was blood mixed with the green of his coat or something else. And the other one? 
the lieutenant asked impatiently. Over there, beside the hut. The lieutenant looked at the bearded man, who was clearly dying. Who's this? A Russian mine lieutenant, a partisan. So that's it. Do you really think I'm going to saddle myself with one of those bastards who'll shoot you in the back any time? As if war at the front wasn't enough. He shouted an order to the two soldiers who were with him. They walked over to the unfortunate man lying on the snow, and two shots rang out. A short time later we were making our way back to the road. Our non-com had abandoned the idea of an improvised labor force, and we would now rejoin our unit, which undoubtedly had not made much progress. I had just been under fire for the first time, an experience I can no longer describe with any precision. An element of the absurd was mixed into the day's events. The Feldwebel's footsteps in the snow were so enormous, and I, in my confusion, kept looking for the young freckled soldier who should have been returning with us. Everything had happened so quickly that I hadn't been able to grasp the significance of anything. Nevertheless, two human beings had suffered senseless deaths. Ours had not yet celebrated his 18th birthday. It had already been dark for some time when we finally found our company. The night was clear and cold, and the thermometer was dropping with horrifying speed. Despite our forced march of nearly four hours, we were shaking with cold and famished. My head was swimming with exhaustion, and frost from my breath lay on the high collar which I had pulled up almost to my eyes. For some time before we reached it, we were able to see our convoy, standing out clearly, black against white. Its progress had indeed been small. The trucks had sunk in through the icy white crust over the tops of their wheels, and great slabs of snow clung to their tires and mudguards. Almost everyone had taken refuge inside the cabs. After chewing on their meager rations, they had wrapped themselves in everything they could find and were trying to sleep, despite the bitter cold. A short distance away, the two fellows who'd been chosen for guard duty were stamping on their boots, hoping to warm their feet. Inside the cabs through the frosted glass, I could see an occasional gleam from someone's cigarette or pipe. I climbed into my truck and felt in the darkness for my rucksack and mess tin. When the tin was propped between my icy fingers, I wolfed down a few mouthfuls of some filthy mixture that tasted like frozen soya. It was so bad that I tipped most of it onto the snow and ate something else. Outside I could hear somebody talking. I craned my neck to see who it was. A small fire had just been kindled in a hole in the snow and was burning with a cheerful brilliance. I jumped down from the truck and hurried as fast as I could toward this source of light, heat, and joy. Three men were standing beside the fire, among them my Feldwebel of this afternoon. He was breaking pieces of wood across his knee. I've had enough of this cold. I had pneumonia last winter and if I get it again it's goodbye to me. Anyway, our trucks are visible for at least two miles, so we're not giving anything away by just lighting a few sticks. You're right, replied a fellow who must have been at least forty-five. The Russians, partisans or not, are all snug in their beds. One certainly would be glad to be home in my bed, said another, staring into the flames. We were all practically in the fire, except for the big felled Webel, who was busily reducing a packing case to fragments. Suddenly someone shouted at us, Hey, you over there? A figure was approaching us between the trucks. We could see the silver trim on his cap gleaming through the darkness. Already the felled Webel and the old man were trampling on the fire. The captain came up to us and we stood at attention. What do you think you're doing? You must have lost your minds, don't you know the orders? Since you've come out to watch round the campfire, you can pick up your guns and make an ice patrol of the neighborhood. Your festivities have undoubtedly attracted a few guests. Now it's up to you to find them, by twos until we leave, understood? It was the last straw. With death in my soul, I went off to look for my damned gun. I was on the point of collapse from hunger, exhaustion, cold, and God knows what else. I would certainly never have the strength to spend the night slogging through that horrible snow, whose frozen crust covered more than two feet of white power, into which I sank over the tops of my boots. I was filled with rage which I couldn't express. Exhaustion prevented reaction. I returned to my companions in misfortune as best I could. The Feldwebel decided that the fellow who was pushing fifty and myself should take the first patrol. 
We'll relieve you in two hours, which will be easier for you. I have never understood why, but I had the distinct impression that the miserable cur had purposely put me with the old man. No doubt he preferred the other fellow as a companion, twenty-five years old and strongly built, to a scrawny seventeen or an old man. I started off with my fellow sufferer, convinced that we were a vulnerable combination. After the first few steps, I tripped and fell down full length onto the snow, scraping my hands against the hard, icy crust. As I was pulling myself up, I was scarcely able to contain a paroxysm of tears. The old man was a decent sort. He, too, seemed to have had about enough. Did you hurt yourself? he asked in a paternal tone. Merd, I replied. He said nothing. Pulling his collar a little higher against his head, he let me get in front of him. I didn't really know where we were supposed to be going, but that was unimportant. What I knew beyond a doubt was that I would double back as soon as the black mass of the convoy was out of sight, and despite my exhaustion, I managed to put a considerable distance between myself and the old man. I moved forward nervously, breathing as little as possible as the icy air burned my nose. But after a moment I couldn't go on. My knees trembled and I dissolved in tears. I could no longer grasp anything that was happening to me. I could see clearly in my mind's eye France and my family and the games I used to play with my friends and my Meccano set. What was I doing here? I can remember crying out between bursts of sobs. I'm too young to be a soldier. I don't know whether or not my companion was surprised by my confusion. When he caught up with me, he contented himself with saying, you walk too quickly, young fellow. You must forgive me if I can't keep up with you. I shouldn't even be a soldier. I was retired before the war, but six months ago they called me up anyway. They need everyone they can get, you know. Anyway, let's hope we get home again safely. As I didn't understand very much about the times and needed someone to blame, I began to attack the Russians. And all of this on account of those bastards. The first one I meet has had it. However, I wasn't able to forget the events of the afternoon. The partisan and his execution had overwhelmed me. The poor old man looked at me in bewilderment. He must have wondered whether he was involved with a party fanatic or a security agent. Yes, he said in a carefully veiled tone. They're certainly making us sweat. It would be better to let them settle it among themselves. They won't stay Bolshevik for long. And in the end, anyway, it's none of our business. And Stalingrad, we certainly have to supply the 6th Army. My uncle is there. They must be having a tough time. Of course they're having a tough time. We don't know everything. Finishing off Zhukov isn't going to be easy. Zhukov will quit, the way he did at Kharkov and Jitomir. This won't be the first time General von Paulus made him run. He said nothing. As we lived without much information from the advanced front, the conversation came to a halt. I certainly never guessed that the doom of Stalingrad was already sealed, that the soldiers of the 6th Army had given up hope and were fighting in horrible conditions with heroic tenacity. The sky was covered with stars. In the moonlight I was able to see the little student's watch strapped on my wrist, a souvenir of my certificat d'études in France. Time seemed to be standing still, and those two hours dragged like centuries. We walked slowly, watching the tips of our boots sink into the snow with every step. There was no wind, but the cold, which was growing increasingly severe, pierced us through and through. For two hours at a time throughout that accursed night, we shivered in this way. Between each tour of duty, I was able to snatch a brief sleep. The first glimmers of light, which found me shoveling snow, fell on a face creased with exhaustion. With dawn, the cold grew even more intense. The woolen gloves we had been issued were worn through and our frost-bitten hands were wrapped in rags or in our extra pairs of socks. But in spite of the exercise of shoveling, the cold was no longer bearable. We slapped our hands against our sides and stamped our feet to keep our chilled blood moving. The captain, in a moment of compassion, ordered some ersatz coffee prepared and served to us boiling hot. This was doubly welcome because for breakfast that morning, we had been given nothing but a portion each of frozen white cheese. The corporal at the canteen told us that the thermometer outside his truck read 24 degrees below zero. I don't remember exactly how much longer this journey took. The days which followed have remained in my memory like a frozen nightmare. The temperature varied between 15 and 25 below zero. 
There was a horrifying day of wind when, despite all of the orders and threats from our officers, we abandoned our shovels and took shelter behind the trucks. On that day, the temperature fell to 35 degrees below zero, and I thought I would surely die. Nothing could warm us. We urinated into our numbed hands to warm them and, hopefully, to cauterize the gaping cracks in our fingers. Four of our men, who were seriously ill, suffering from pulmonary and bronchial pneumonia, lay groaning in makeshift beds set up in one of the trucks. There were only two medical orderlies for our company, and there wasn't much they could do. In addition to these serious illnesses, there were at least 40 cases of frostbite. Some men had patches of skin on the ends of their noses, which had been frozen and had become infected. Similar infection was common in the folds of the eyelids, around the ears, and particularly on the hands. I myself was not seriously affected, but each movement of my fingers opened and closed deep crevices, which oozed blood. At moments the pain was so intense that I felt sick at my stomach. At moments my despair was so intense that I broke down in tears. But as everyone was preoccupied with his own troubles, no one paid much attention. Twice I went to the canteen truck which doubled as the infirmary to have my hands washed in 90-degree alcohol. This produced paroxysms of pain which made me cry aloud. But afterward my hands felt warm for a few minutes. Our inadequate diet contributed to our desperation. From Minsk, our point of departure, to Kiev, the first stop, was a distance of about 250 miles. With all the difficulties of the route taken into consideration, the authorities had given us food for five days. In fact, we required eight days, which obliged us to consume some of the rations intended for the front. In addition, we had to abandon three of the 38 vehicles in our group because of mechanical failure, destroying them along with their cargoes so that they wouldn't fall into the hands of the partisans. Of the four men who were seriously ill, two had died. Many others suffered from frostbite, and a few had to have frozen hands or feet amputated. Three days before we reached Kiev, we crossed what must once have been the Russian line of defense. We drove for hours through a landscape littered with the carcasses of tanks, trucks, guns, and aircraft, gutted and burned a scattering of junk which stretched as far as the eye could see. Here and there, crosses or stakes marked the hasty burial of the thousands of German and Russian soldiers who had fallen on this plain. In fact, many more Russians than Germans had been killed. However, insofar as was possible, the soldiers of the Reich were given decent burials, while each Orthodox emblem marked the grave of ten or twelve Soviet soldiers. Our journey across this boneyard naturally did not make us feel any warmer. The huge shell holes, which we had to fill in as best we could, made it particularly difficult. Finally, our convoy arrived at Kiev. This handsome city had not suffered much damage. The Red Army had tried to stop the Wehrmacht outside the town, in the zone we had passed through. When they had no longer been able to withstand German pressure, they had preferred to withdraw to the other side of the city, to spare it the kind of destruction Minsk had suffered. Kiev was our first stop, halfway between Minsk and Kharkov. Our ultimate destination, Stalingrad, was still more than 600 miles away. Kiev was an important strategic center where units coming from Poland and Romania regrouped and made ready for the offensive which would push on to the Caucasus and the Caspian Sea. To an even greater degree than Minsk, the city swarmed with soldiers and military vehicles with the difference that here there was a perceptible atmosphere of alert. Our group entered the outlying zone of the city and halted until further orders from the commandanter. Once again, we found ourselves walking on a snow-covered roadway as slick and firmly packed as a ski run. We thought we had reached the end of our troubles. Everyone was anticipating the arrival of orders which, we felt certain, would direct us to our new lodgings. We were sent first of all to the hygienic center, which was extremely welcome, as the cold had made even the most cursory washing impossible. We were all disgustingly dirty and covered with vermin. Those with serious injuries were hospitalized, a category to which only seven men were admitted. For everyone else, the journey continued. We spent only seven hours in Kiev. As we left the remarkably well-organized sanitary service, our group was ordered to stand at attention on the snow-covered esplanade in front of the building. 
a Hauptmann arrived at high speed in a Volkswagen. He turned toward us and delivered a short speech without getting out of the car. Soldiers, Germans, convoy troops, at this hour when the conquests of the Reich extend across a vast territory, the Fatherland depends on you to assure the victory of our arms by your devotion. It is your responsibility to hasten the pace at which essential supplies reach our fighting troops. The hour has come for you to perform your duty on the front you know so well, the road fraught with a thousand perils and hardships upon which you have already expended such prodigious energies. From our factories where our workers are drawing on all their strength to forge the necessary weapons, through your exhausting journey toward our heroic combatants, no one is allowed a moment's respite so long as any German soldier might suffer from a shortage of weapons, food, or clothing. The nation is drawing on all its strength to ensure that our soldiers at the front receive what they require and are thus able to retain their enthusiasm and confidence in our solidarity. Not one of us has the right to flinch or falter in the face of momentary discouragement. No one has the right to doubt the heroism daily confirmed by our fresh victories. We all have to bear the same sufferings, and dealing with them as a unified group is the best way of surmounting them. Never forget that the nation owes you everything, and that in return it expects everything of you up to and including the supreme sacrifice. You must learn to support suffering without complaint, because you are German. Heil Hitler. Heil Hitler, we answered in unison. The Hauptmann cleared his throat and continued in a less theatrical tone. You will make up a full group and will rejoin the 124th and the 125th at the edge of town, on the roll band to Kharkov. Your formation will be accompanied by a section of motorized combat troops belonging to Panzer Division Stolpnagel. They will protect your convoy from the terrorists who will try to impede your advance. As you will see, the Reich is making every effort to facilitate your task. He saluted, and his orderly immediately shifted into gear. We joined the two other sections of our company at the selected place to form the 19th Company Rollbahn under Commandant Ultranair. My first thought was that now I would surely run into my friends from training camp if they hadn't been transferred or killed. I didn't know whether they'd left Minsk before or after us, but in fact our old 19th had been reformed. We now possessed a rolling kitchen, which could serve us hot meals. This made a great difference to us. Immediately before our departure, we were served a large hot meal, which produced an almost unbelievable sense of well-being and raised our spirits to a remarkable degree. The cold seemed to have settled at about 4 degrees below zero, which was an improvement, but then we had just taken hot showers and changed our clothes. I had no trouble finding Halls, whose exuberant gestures I recognized easily. Uh, well, what do you think of the weather, young one? And of the restaurant, hein? It's ten days since I've swallowed anything hot. We thought we'd die of cold on that damn train. You were on a train, if that's not luck. Luck. You can talk. You should have been there when the locomotive blew up. It made a cloud of steam at least a hundred yards high. Four of the fellows were killed and seven wounded. Morvan was wounded while we were cleaning up the mess. It went on like that for five days. I was with a patrol that went after some terrorists. We caught two of them hiding in a Kolkhoz, collective farm. One of the peasants they'd robbed put us on their trail and afterward invited us to his place and gave us a regular feast. I wasted no time in telling him my adventures. Talking this way made us both feel better. We had just turned into Lenzen and Olenzheim. Our sense of happiness and relief at meeting again was so great that quite spontaneously, we grabbed each other by the shoulders and mimed an exaggerated polonaise, shouting with laughter. Some of the older men stared at us in astonishment, unable to see any reason for this burst of gaiety, so inconsistent with the gray and icy atmosphere. Where's Farstein? I asked. Oof, roared Lenzen still laughing. He's snug and warm in his truck. Fi sprained his ankle, and it's so swollen he can't take his boot off, so he's waiting for it to deflate. Fi's making the most of it, Howells remarked. If I carried on like that every time I turned my ankle... Our conversation was interrupted by the order for departure, and we returned to our posts. Knowing that my friends were there, with only a few trucks between us, made me feel a great deal better and I almost forgot that each turn of the wheels was taking me closer to the front. It was still so far away.
We were traveling on bad roads covered with snow and ice. On either side, a wall of snow thrown back by road clearing operations hid the countryside. Through the occasional gaps, we were able to see traces of the terrible fighting which had overrun this part of the country the year before. The hastily patched road was so rough that we had to crawl through several hundred miles of this ruined countryside. The troops of von Vix, Guderian, von Reichenau, and von Stulpnagel had wrenched this territory from the Soviets after weeks of heavy fighting and held several hundreds of thousands of prisoners between Kiev and Kharkov. The amount of Russian war materiel strewn about under the snow made me wonder how they could possibly have much left. Rising temperatures brought fresh snowfalls, which made it necessary for us to bring out our shovels again. Fortunately, a section of the armored column which was supposed to accompany us joined us two days later. We were able to attach four or five trucks to the back of a tank so that, with their engines going, the trucks were able to manage a slipping, sliding advance, despite the snow and ice. However, the low clouds soon vanished, leaving a pale blue sky. The thermometer plunged sharply, and we were caught once more by a biting cold on that accursed Russian plain. Occasionally a group of German airplanes would pass over our column with throbbing engines. We waved wildly at the pilots, who responded by dipping their wings. Higher up, squadrons of Ju-52s passed slowly over us, flying east. Our hot meals no longer warmed us, and frostbite was eating into my hands once again. Fortunately, this time our convoy included a doctor. Each time we stopped to eat, we lined up beside his truck. He coated my hands with a greasy, curative ointment, which I tried to keep on as long as possible, as it reduced the pain in my cracked skin and preserved it from the cold. I kept my hands buried in the depths of my giant overcoat pockets, unless absolutely forced to pull them out. And then I was very careful not to rub off the ointment against the rough cloth. I spent long hours in the cab of a three-and-a-half-ton Renault, jolting from rut to rut. From time to time we had to remove the snow which accumulated between the mudguard and the tire, or help another machine which had skidded and gotten stuck. Otherwise we avoided everything which obliged us to step outside. So far I had escaped guard duty at night. When darkness made further advance impossible, we stopped where we were. The driver had the right to the seat. I usually slept on the floor with my legs wedged in beside the pedals and my nose on the engine, which gave off a sickening stench of hot oil. We always woke up stiff and numb with cold. Well before daybreak, we began the exhausting struggle of starting our frozen engines. Howls had come to see me several times, but my driver always protested that three was too many for our tiny cab. He advised me to go and see my friend instead, but that always came to the same thing, and there was certainly no question of standing outside for a chat. One day, just after we had passed a large town with a Luftwaffe airfield beside it, we were joined by a reconnaissance plane, which entered into radio communication with the commander group of the armored section accompanying us. A moment later, the plane left the convoy and veered to the north. The tanks in our column disappeared in whirlwinds of snow thrown up by their treads. We went on as before, without feeling any special anxiety. A few hours later we heard the booming sound of distant explosions. This stopped, began again a few minutes later, then stopped, then began again. At eleven o'clock the convoy halted in a village covered with snow. The sun was shining, and its gleam on the snow made us squint. The cold, although intense, was bearable. We walked over to the soup truck, whose two stoves were belching smoke. The first arrivals were sent by the cook to fetch the kettles. This cook was not at all a bad sort, and his skill was adequate at least to prevent insurrection. The dishes he prepared really weren't bad at all. The only oddity of his cooking style was that everything without exception was served with the same thick flour sauce. I joined Hals and Lenzen, and we were walking back to our trucks, bent over our steaming mess tins. Suddenly a series of more or less distant explosions shook the icy air. We stopped for a moment and listened. Everyone else seemed to be doing the same thing. The explosions began again. Some of them were obviously far away. Instinctively, we began to hurry. What's going on? Lenzen asked an older soldier who was climbing into his truck. Guns, fellows, we're getting closer, he said. We had all guessed this already, but we needed confirmation. Ha, huh, said Halls. 
I'm going to get my gun. Personally, I didn't take any of this too seriously. There were a few more explosions, some separate and distinct, others overlapping each other. The departure whistle blew and we climbed back into our trucks. The convoy jolted into motion. An hour later, as we reached the top of a hill, the gunfire brought us to a complete stop. It was coming from much closer. Each explosion literally shook the air, which was a very strange sensation. Some nervous drivers had stepped on their brakes much too quickly. Their trucks had skidded on the ice, and the drivers were racing the engines, trying unsuccessfully to straighten their machines. I had opened our door and was looking down the line of trucks. A Volkswagen was driving from the rear at top speed, and a lieutenant was shouting through its open door, Hurry up, get going, keep moving, you... Help that idiot out of the rut. I jumped down from our Renault and joined a group of soldiers trying to pull an Opal Blitz back onto the road. The firing had begun again. It seemed to be quite close and coming from the north. Slowly and with difficulty, the convoy began to move. As we had jammed on our brakes in the middle of an ascent, my driver had a particularly hard time starting up our truck. We descended slowly into a rolling wooded countryside. The dull sound of explosions continued. Suddenly the trucks at the head of the column stopped again, and we heard the blast of a whistle. We quickly jumped to the ground. Soldiers were running to the head of the convoy. What was happening? The lieutenant of a while ago was running too, collecting a group of soldiers as he went by. I was one of them. Carrying our Mausers and running as fast as we could, we reached the front of the column. The big commander Gruppe half. Tracks seemed to have driven deliberately into the thick snow at the side of the road. Partisans up ahead, a Feldwebel shouted. Scatter for defense, he pointed to our left. Without understanding very much, I followed the sergeant who was at the head of our group of fifteen soldiers and plunged into the snowy slope. As I pulled myself up on the white barrier, I could see very clearly a swarming mass of black figures emerging from a stunted woods and proceeding at right angles to our line of march. The Russians seemed to be moving as slowly as we were. The cold and the weight of our clothes combined to deprive this spectacle of the animation of westerns or of American so-called war films. The cold made everything sluggish, both gaiety and sadness, courage and fear. Ducking my head like everyone else, I moved forward paying more attention to the position of my boots than to the movements of the enemy. The partisans were still too far away for me to see them in any detail. I imagined that, like us, they must be making huge strides to avoid disappearing in a hole in the snow. Dig your foxholes, the Feldwebel ordered, lowering his voice as if the other side could hear us. I didn't have a shovel, but scraped away some snow with the butt of my rifle. Once I was crouched in this relative shelter, I was able to observe the scene at leisure. I was astounded by the number of men coming out of the woods opposite. There were so many of them, and I could see still others in the forest itself, through the branches of the leafless trees. They looked like ants swarming through tall grass. They were obviously moving from north to south. As we were moving east to west, I couldn't grasp their intention. Perhaps they were going to try to encircle us. Our troops had just set up a heavy machine gun battery on the slope nearest us, about twenty yards away. I didn't understand why there had not yet been any exchange of fire. The enemy had begun to cross the road, about two hundred yards from us. The sound of big guns from the north was louder than ever, and there seemed to be some answering fire directly opposite us. My hands and feet were beginning to feel the cold. I didn't understand our situation, and felt entirely calm. The band of Russians crossed the road without bothering us. They appeared to outnumber us by three or four to one. Our convoy consisted of a hundred trucks with a hundred armed drivers and sixty accompanying troops, whose sole function was defense. In Attitude, there were ten officers and non-coms, a doctor, and two medical orderlies. Each explosion created clouds of powdered snow. From the wooded hill in the near distance, Plumes of smoke synchronized with the increasingly frequent sounds of explosion rose into the air. The heavy machine gun to my right burst into sound for a moment and then fell silent. Stupidly, instead of crouching down in my hole, I lifted my head. I could see little white clouds puffing out among the numerous silhouettes of the partisans. There was a sound of dry detonation, with an answer in kind from the Russians. My eardrums had begun to feel as though they would burst from the noise of the machine gun 
which was joined by another on the slope opposite. Everywhere, soldiers were firing their Mausers. Over in the Russian sector, the black silhouettes were running in all directions, faster and faster, through the puffs of white smoke. Some of them fell and lay motionless. The sun went on shining. None of it seemed really serious. Here and there, Russian bullets whistled through the air. The noise was deafening. With my slow reflexes, I hadn't yet fired. To my right, someone cried out. The sound of firing was almost continuous. The Bolsheviks were running as fast as they could toward the shelter of the snowy thickets. Our tanks were rolling toward them with sharp bursts of gunfire. Three or four Russian bullets landed in the snow in front of me, and I began to fire blindly, like everyone else. Seven or eight other tanks had arrived and were harassing the partisans. The whole episode lasted about 20 minutes, and when it was over I had fired about a dozen cartridges. A short time later our tanks and armored cars returned. Three of them were driving prisoners ahead of them, in groups of about fifteen men, who all looked deeply humiliated. Three German soldiers supported by their comrades climbed down from one of the cars. One of them seemed almost unconscious, and the other two were grimacing with pain. Three wounded Russians and two Germans were lying inert on the back of one of the tanks, one of them moaning. A short distance off a German soldier leaning against a snowbank was gesturing to us and holding his head, which was red with blood. The road is clear, announced the commanding officer of the Mark IV nearest us. You can go ahead. We helped carry the wounded to the hospital truck. I went back to my Renault. Lenzen passed by close to me and shook his head in perplexity. Did you see that? he asked. Yes, do you know if anyone was killed? Of course. The convoy started off again. The idea of death troubled me, and suddenly I felt afraid. The sunshine of a moment ago had been pale, and the cold had become more intense. Bodies in long brown coats were lying along the sides of the road. One of them gestured as we passed. Hey! I nudged my driver. There's a wounded man waving at us. Poor fellow, let's hope his side takes care of him. War is hard that way, tomorrow it may be our turn. Yes, but we've got a doctor, he could do something for him. You can talk, we've got two truckloads of wounded already and the doctor has more than enough to keep him busy. You mustn't be upset by all this, you know. You'll see plenty more of it. One already have. One have two, he said without believing me. Especially, I've seen my own knee. The whole kneecap was taken out by a shell in Poland. I thought they were going to send me home again. But they stuck me into the driver's corps instead, along with the old men, the boys, and the infirm. It's no joke, you know, a wound like that really hurts especially if you have to wait for hours before they give you any morphine. He launched into the history of the Polish campaign as he had experienced it. At that time he had belonged to the 6th Army which now was fighting in Stalingrad. It was growing dark. Our long convoy stopped in a small hamlet. The armored column was there too. The captain had ordered this halt so that the wounded could be cared for. The crust of snow and the roughness of the road made the hospital truck rock and jolt. The surgeon couldn't operate under such conditions. Two Russians had already died of hemorrhage, and the rest of the men had already been waiting for several hours. Our truck had just stopped beside a large building where the peasants stored the harvest. I was about to open the door and run to the kitchen truck when my driver held me back. Don't be in such a hurry unless you want to be on guard duty tonight. The sergeant doesn't keep records here, you know, the way he does at the barracks. He just grabs the first people he sees, assigns them, and then takes it easy. It was true. A short time later I was listening to the complaints of the eternally hungry Halls. Scheisse, they've stuck me for guard duty again. God knows what'll happen to us all. It's getting colder and colder. We won't be able to stand it. It was another clear night, and the thermometer fell to 22 degrees below freezing. I thanked my driver for saving me from another night in the open air. However, the fate that befell me instead almost made me regret my luck. We were walking toward the kitchen truck feeling somewhat anxious about dinner, wondering if there would be enough left to fill our mess tins. When the cook saw us coming, he couldn't resist a little sarcasm. So, you're not feeling hungry tonight. 
He had already taken the tureens off the fire and replaced them with the big serving dishes, which were filled with hissing water coming to the boil. Hurry up and eat, he said, plunging his gloved hand armed with a big spoon into the depths of one of the tureens. One have to boil this water for the surgeon. He's busy carving up the wounded. We were bolting our tepid meal still wearing our ragged gloves when a lieutenant arrived. Is the water nearly ready? Just now, Leutnant, it's just boiling. Good. The lieutenant's eye fell on us. You two, take the water to the doctor. He pointed to the lighted doorway of one of the houses. We closed our mess tins, still half full of food, and hooked them onto our belts. I grabbed one of the steaming basins, taking care not to empty its contents onto my feet, and walked toward the improvised operating room. The sole advantage of being inside this house was its temperature. It had been a long time since any of us had experienced indoor warmth. The doctor had requisitioned the large common room of a Soviet farmer, and was busy with the leg of a poor fellow, stretched out on the central table. Two other soldiers were holding the patient, who was jerking spasmodically and moaning with pain. Everywhere, on benches, on the floor, on the big storage chests, wounded soldiers were lying or sitting, groaning as they waited. Two orderlies were tending to them. The floor was littered with bloody bandages. Two Russian women were washing the surgical instruments in basins of hot water. The room was extremely badly lit. The doctor had put the farmer's big gas lamp beside the operating table. The farmer himself was holding another lamp over the surgeon's head. A lieutenant and a sergeant were each holding another lamp. In an angle of the room made by the big comer chimney, a young Russian was crying. He looked about seventeen like me. I put my basin down beside the doctor who plunged a thick wad of dressing into it. I stayed where I was, transfixed by the terrible sight in front of me. I couldn't lift my eyes from that naked thigh inside which the surgeon was working. The skin around the wound seemed to have been crushed, and everything was soaked with blood. New streams of blood of a brighter, clearer red kept running from the enormous hole in which the doctor was working with what looked like a pair of flat-bladed scissors. My head began to swim, and I felt sick at my stomach but I couldn't look away. The patient was tossing his head from one side to the other. He was being held down firmly by two other soldiers. His face was completely drained of color and streaming with sweat. They had stuffed a bandage into his mouth perhaps to keep him from crying out. It was one of the soldiers from the armored column. I couldn't move. Hold his leg, the doctor said softly to me. I hesitated and he looked at me again. My trembling hands took hold of the mangled leg. As they touched the skin, I could feel myself shaking. Gently, murmured the doctor. I saw the scalpel cut even more deeply into the wound, and I could feel the muscles of the leg tensing and relaxing. Then I closed my eyes. I could hear the sounds made by the surgical instruments and the heavy panting breath of the patient, who kept moving in agony despite the partial anesthetic. Then, although I could hardly bear to recognize it, I heard the sound of a saw. A moment later, the leg was heavier in my hand, unbelievably heavy, and I saw that it was supported five inches above the table, only by my anguished hands. The surgeon had just detached it from the body. I remained for a moment in a ludicrous and tragic attitude, holding my hideous burden. I thought I was going to faint. Finally, I put it down on a pile of bandages beside the table. I shall never forget that leg, even if I live a hundred years. My driver had managed to leave, and I waited for a moment of general inattention to do the same thing. Unfortunately, such a moment did not arrive until very late that night. I had to do a great many other things almost as troubling as the amputation. It was nearly one o'clock in the morning when I finally opened the double doors of the house. As the cold struck me, it seemed more violent than ever. I hesitated. But the thought of returning to those dying men in those streams of blood turned me resolutely back into the night. The sky was clear and light, and the air seemed absolutely still. The shadows of the houses and the trucks were stamped with precise outlines on the hard, gleaming snow. I couldn't see a living soul. I walked through the village looking for my Renault. The whole convoy could have been destroyed before anyone gave the alarm. The door of an ispa flew open, and a bundle of blankets with a mauser slung across it. 
ventured a few faltering steps onto the snow. When the man inside the blankets caught sight of me, he mumbled a few words. You go in now. It's my turn. Go where? To warm up unless you feel like taking another round. But <laughs> I'm not on guard. I've just been helping the surgeon and now I'm going to get some sleep. I see. I thought you were... He mumbled a name. Did you say there was somewhere to get warm? On in there. They've made it headquarters for the guard. We take shifts every 15 or 20 minutes. Of course, you don't get any sleep that way, but it's better than freezing for two hours. Yes, thank you. I'll go in. I pushed open the heavy door and went inside. A big fire was blazing in the fireplace. Four soldiers, one of whom was Howells, were roasting potatoes and other vegetables under the ashes. The light from the fire was the only light in the room. Another fellow came in right after me, probably the guard I had been mistaken for. I warmed up the rest of the food in my mess tin, ate without appetite, and stretched out on the floor in front of the fireplace to sleep as best I could. Every fifteen or twenty minutes, one of the guards would shake awake some poor fellow flattened by sleep. From time to time the voice of someone protesting his fate would waken me. It was still dark when the reveille whistle shrilled in my ears. Slowly we stood up on the floor which had served as our bed. We were rather stiff, but it had been a long time since any of us had slept without feeling cold. A young Russian woman was coming toward us from the shadows in the corner of the room. She was carrying a steaming pot, which she held out to us, smiling. It was hot milk. For a moment I wondered if the milk might not be poisoned, but Hal's, who preferred to die with a full stomach, had already grabbed the pot and helped himself to a generous swig. We passed the milk around among the four of us. Then Halls laughed and returned it to the Russian woman. Neither of them could understand a word the other said. Halls went up to her and kissed her on both cheeks. She blushed a deep red. We bowed and left.